when we started the when my partner Ed and I started Evelyn's Crackers, the question was for us, do we continue in the same vein that I had been doing a fair amount of baking with white flour that you, you know, you could get from a distributor uh, or from a grocery store, or did we want to apply our local aesthetic of, um, of trying to be as local as possible, right? So did we want to apply our principles when it comes to cooking to baking, right? So when we cook, we try to source as locally as possible. We source from farmer's markets. So we thought we could apply that philosophy to grains. And when you're dealing with local grains, it's really easy to find them in whole grain form. And it actually turns out that was the only form I could find them in when we started Evelyn's Crackers in 2008. I could only get locally milled, uh, locally grown whole grain flour because the farmers were not sifting, right? They didn't have the, the infrastructure set up. They had, there was one farmer we were dealing with, she had a stone mill, in went the grain, out came the flour, that was it. So for us, the question of why whole grain versus white was already settled for us. And it was more about our commitment to using local grains and then we, uh, we just had to figure out how to use them. Um, and then it turns out there are just so many benefits to whole grain, right? So we, I, I feel we got extremely lucky, right, that we were forced into this. When using whole grain flour, it certainly brings up a lot of questions. You, you've kind of put yourself in this sort of narrow box because suddenly uh, certain things that you're used to baking don't seem achievable, right? Because you're, you're not seeing them, nobody else is doing it, right? You didn't, back when we started, I, I had not seen a whole grain croissant or whole grain brioche. So when we were getting grains um, back then, we were getting whole grain red fife and whole grain spelt and whole grain rye. And none of those grains sifted or in whole grain form really qualify as a strong red flour. So I knew that we weren't going to be making those, you know, tartine style sourdough. Uh, and then plus it had all the bran and the middlings in it, which are the other two components. Because when you have white flour, that's just the endosperm, the, the inner part of the grain kernel. Um, and that is, you know, separated out from the germ, the bran, and then the little layer under the bran. Um, so we just had this flour that smelled great and was delicious and we thought okay let's let's just keep it simple so we started doing crackers uh, I had already been making crackers back in the catering business and I had already done some whole grain baking in my previous life working for other people I worked at a, a bakery in upstate New York where we did a fair amount of whole grain I did a stage in Germany where we did a lot of whole grain especially rye and that so like the seed was already planted that those kind of flowers have a lot more flavor. And I was so intrigued by rye uh, and how delicious it was. And it struck me more as, as food, right? Not a slice of rye bread is, is a meal as opposed to your slice of uh, white sourdough, which is, you know, nice to spread something on um, as a base for something, right? But rye is a complete thing in itself. So some, a little bit of the foundation was already there. And then just the commitment to, well, this is what we have. We have to figure out how to use it. Uh, just led us down this path of, of growing the product list. So now we make a lot fewer crackers and we make a ton of baked goods. And we have a line of, I guess you would call them Northern European breads, right? Mainly based on rye, uh, but often supplemented with a little spelt. And then, uh, and then there's just been a, a whole grain movement growing in North America. And so now you can find whole grain croissants and whole grain brioche and all of these other things. And it's, it's great to see people catching on and really pushing the envelope. And the quality of the grain has gotten much better too. The quality of the grain has gotten better because farmers have more experience. There's um, the bakers on the other end who are buying the grain are more demanding. And I feel that uh, farmers have learned how to mill 
And there's also been a lot of small mills popping up who are dedicated to producing really beautiful flour. And that starts with them sourcing uh, grain that is really clean, uh, you know, has been cleaned well, all the debris is removed, um, that meets certain qualities, the kernels are nice and plump, it probably has a certain protein level, it's been tested for sprouting, right? They're, they're treating it as, as that this is the only flour the baker is going to use, whereas I feel before when I was buying from the farmers, um, yes, I was other, other bakers are buying whole grain too, but they were mixing it with a ton of strong white flour. So it didn't matter about the quality of the grain. So there, the farmers were not getting any feedback that this grain wasn't okay. So we got grain that was sprouted. We got grain that was just really poorly milled. We got grain that the spelt had a bunch of buckwheat in it. You know, so because mm. nobody cared because they were just throwing 10 to 20 percent, maybe at most, you know, in their bread loaf. Um, so it took it, you know, it took a lot of pushing um, and it took a lot of digging around to find farmers who are as dedicated as we are to uh, to really showing how good whole grain can be. So when we started Evelyn's Crackers, we started at a farmer's market. And the farmer's market audience is already slightly alternative. So we were able to present whole grain as a local food product and as something healthier. So the farmer's market audience was definitely more receptive to whole grain versus white flour. But there, of course, are other white flour bakers in the market. So we always had customers coming up assuming that we were gluten-free or vegan because our stuff looked different and looked a lot browner. And then I had labels like barley and rye and buckwheat on items. And a lot of customers were not familiar with those grains. Um, a lot of customers still aren't familiar with red fife, which at one point was grown across Canada in the 1800s, right? It used to be an extremely common grain and it's it's made a comeback. So as, when it comes to customer resistance or confusion or hesitancy, we absolutely still run into it. it takes a little bit of hand holding. Um, and one of the ways we've dealt with that is we make fairly simple products that are, that are still recognizable. Like we make brownies. I make a chocolate chip cookie. Um, I make a pound cake, you know, the, the breads have been tricky, uh, because they look like little bricks. Um, you know, you're not going to see this beautiful and we sell them by the halves. So you see the crumb. So you don't see these amazing holes everywhere. You don't see this white or tan crumb. Um, it's in a different shape because they're baked in pans or molds. So there's still a fair amount of education there. We have been able to sell people on the bread because we talk about how good rye is for you, especially when it's fermented. Uh, and then there has been, you know, Northern European breads have become trendy, right? Everyone knows they're like, oh, that's Danish rye. I'm like, well, no, not really, but sure. <laughs> sure it is. Have some. <laughs> you know, so we have been helped by ongoing food trends. So I feel... At this point, we're no longer a trailblazer, which is is kind of nice, right? And and now we have people who who seek us out because they're looking for something different than uh, than white flour. So when we started in two thousand eight, the farmers markets in Toronto were still fairly new and small. So our business was really small, and we had a hard time breaking out of that. And as far as growing the business, I would say absolutely the first eight years were slow and hard and kind of banging my head against the wall. Um, especially when there's been a couple bakeries in Toronto that started around the same time that are quite big and successful now, but they went a more traditional route. But I would say in the last, yeah, five to six years, there has been an explosion in interest and, uh, People are gaining terminology and there's been cookbooks with whole grain. Uh, Instagram, Instagram has been incredibly helpful. Uh, also all the grain conferences that have gone on um, 
have been also helpful because bakers get to see it. And when you get a bunch of bakers together and there's millers and farmers there, um, you know, the millers and farmers want whole grain. Uh, it's, it's better for them so and easier for them. So there's, there's definitely been a real push. So when it comes to whole grains, I think there's been a few factors of, of people really kind of leading the way or certainly opening the door. I'll give a shout out to Dan Barber for his third plate book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he did a, a beautiful job talking about grain and uh, his position as grain as a local food that, you know, that's absolutely how we've have viewed grain since we've started. Um, there's been other chefs. I'll give a huge shout out to Nan Kohler of Kristen Toll. I feel she has been a real trailblazer and her partnership with Farmer Mai and their flower share uh, has been exceptional. And Nan working closely with the California Grain Commission has been excellent. I feel that Maine Grains and their kneading conference has done a, a really good job and they really focus on the home baker. Uh, so in some sense, I feel it's the home bakers who have done more for whole grain baking than the chefs. I, be, I mean, there are chefs who, you know, will make a nice barley risotto, put some whole grain in their bread, you know, talk about heirloom grains, but I feel it's a lot of home bakers who are experimenting um, with all the whole grain stuff and experimenting with different flours. Uh, also, Salu Bakery, their pastry chef in Washington, D.C., their pastry chef, Charbel, he is making the most beautiful pastries and they're all whole grain. And not only that, he's using grains like millet and sorghum, which you, you really don't see anywhere. And they're grown in that mid-Atlantic region. So, you know, and again, so much of this is accessible through Instagram because you're getting all these visuals of what people are doing. And as soon as you see it, your impulse is, look, I wanna make that. Where can I find that? Right, so that's that's been really huge. So, I mean, just trying to grow the business for financial purposes, but I, I definitely have an advocate ad activist side and participating in grain conferences and teaching whole grain workshops when a lot of the other instructors were still using white flour. I've always been pushing, pushing, pushing what's next. And then from whole grain, we've also been trying to move into other grains besides wheat. Um, and that fits into our philosophy, like you just have to use what's grown locally. So here in Ontario, they don't really grow bread wheat, uh, but they grow a lot of rye, they grow a lot of spelt, they grow a lot of buckwheat, they grow a lot of barley. So we absolutely have to use those. And I realized I needed kind of a side, a little bit of a side job from Evelyn's Crackers because we're just about the products we make, but I wanted a place where people who were curious about grains could go. So I started a website called The Grain Project, and that's really just my philosophy on um, grains as local food and what grains I have available to me and why it's important. And I talk, there's a little bit of science in there when it comes to like why whole grains are good for your gut, um, why it's whole grains growing these different types of grains from wheat to rye to barley are good for the soil. Talk a little bit about regenerative agriculture. So it's more of a bigger holistic picture uh, of grains, right? Not just you should bake with whole grains because they taste really good. That's more just the Evelyn's Cracker side. The life of a baker, it can take a lot of different forms. Um, we've chosen to have a bakery where we don't work overnight. I, I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that. I'm done with it. We have a child. We try to have a life. So I don't do things like croissants and Danish because those really need to be baked and sold within, in a fairly short time frame. Uh, so our life is five days a week production. Uh, then we, with some markets during those Monday through Friday days, and then we have our big markets on Saturday and Sunday off. Um, just depending on how busy it is, the workday is anywhere from eight to 12 to 15 hours. It can be really physical. Uh, you're constantly moving, that's for sure. Um, and you know, you have to be careful about carpal tunnel and repetitive 
stress injuries and all that. Um, so you, you do try to balance it. Um, but at this point, my work schedule is pretty sweet. I have time for my morning yoga. Um, we always sit down for lunch, you know, try to get home for dinner. And, and that has also dictated what products we make, right? We do a lot of shelf stable things, uh, the crackers, the granola, shortbread, other packaged cookies, brownies. Um, and yeah, and things that are easy because it's, we're a really small company. So I want to be able to make something quite quickly. And, and there are many things that I still love. I like being physical. I like making stuff. I really like interacting with our customers at the market. Uh, but I am getting to the point where I want to move more into the educational side of things and do baking workshops and just really push people to do it themselves. And I also feel because we are such a small bakery, there's only so much we can do for local grains, right? Like I'm not gonna be the farmer's main customer. So we need to expand the message. So when, you know, home bakers to cross the Toronto, greater Toronto area wanna make a chocolate chip cookie, they wanna source whole grain spelt or whole grain red fife or barley, uh, right? That's gonna carry a lot more weight than me, you know, making 500 cookies a week. Um, so I think, yeah, I definitely, as I get older in my fifties, I'm definitely ready to sort of shift, shift what we do. I think about where we want to take the business next. Ed and I initially had thought we would just keep expanding our business and move into a much larger wholesale. Um, so when it comes to expanding our products, we just realized that we're too small and it requires a really big financial investment. As a baker, you, you have to figure out what kind of business you wanna run and how much debt you wanna go into. And we've always just managed to run this small bakery with no debt. And we've been tempted by, oh sure, let's invest in this and this and really roll out a lot of product um, and you know try to sell it across Ontario or even nationwide. and to be that kind of bakery takes a group of investors behind you. And because I'm so committed to what we do when it comes to grains and the quality of ingredients, I, I don't want to compromise. So we've never courted outside help. Uh, so we've kept our bakery small, which means more physical work for us, which is another reason that's leading me to, okay, it's time to pull back and, and, focus more on education. And, and we also feel right now that there's other bakers doing this work. Um, we don't always need to be the ones showing the way. When it comes to the grain movement and how far we've come and where we need to go next, I think there's a lot of different issues at play and we need to be really careful what the next steps are. Um, there's a few farmers who absolutely feel that we have to get the bigger people, bigger players involved, General Mills, Gorilla Pasta. Um, there's a couple bakers, myself included, who don't trust that at all, with the understanding that we are such fringe players that we're not making a huge dent when it comes to the commodity grain market. But the danger in letting the in trying to convince the big guys and letting them take the message is that it will be corrupted and co-opted because uh, it's a capitalist system and you cannot have a large scale commodity system that pays the farmers extremely well, that pays the laborers, that pays the millers, that guarantees you fresh flour, that it, it, it's a system based on exploitation. So we're not suddenly going to replace that system with um, have them all use whole grain, right? Because then you're just going to have farmers growing commodity scale whole grain with the same crap uh, sprayed on it, um, roller milled and reassembled like they do whole grain now. So I think it has to absolutely be, continue to be a grassroots movement. Um, and unfortunately, I think it it, it, it does need, we do need to kind of convert one baker at a time. We need a bunch more local regional mills. 
We need a lot of education, uh, recipes, really things that are easily accessible. We have to figure out also how to get these grains easily accessible. Um, I think it's really great to think big about all the changes we could make, but there's still so much missing infrastructure. Uh, it wouldn't take much for somebody like ADM or General Mills to come in and just take over and then just push their one strain of monocrop monoculture wheat, right? That isn't dealing with climate change, has no genetic diversity, doesn't taste good. Um, so I, I, we have to be really careful. So as far as what's next for the grain movement, um, I think it, it is still quite fringe. Yes, if you go on Instagram, it seems like everyone and their mother is a whole grain baker, uh, depending on who you follow, right? And you can find it in every, in almost every country, right? Um, certainly in the North American, European, Australian world. Um, I think the whole grain movement needs to step back and, and think about a lot of things. You know, we need to incorporate things like millet and sorghum, look at traditional, more traditional grains. Um, we need to make the movement much more inclusive. It's, it's still such an incredibly white movement. Uh, there's still a lot of elements of growiness going on. Uh, I think we need to all take our egos out of it and think about uh, the more holistic picture of where do we fit in the local food system. And that means dealing with um, things like, you know, capitalism and colonialism. And we have to talk about the primacy of wheat. I, I don't know if wheat is the best thing to be grown on all of this land. I think there's other crops that are better for the soil. Uh, I don't think even a genetically diverse population wheat is going to solve climate change. Uh, it comes down to the farmer and how they're tending to the soil. So there's just so many other components that, that we have to think about, right? And food justice and food access. And, and it's not that I want whole grains to be cheap because that relies on exploitation, but how are we going to make these grains more accessible and more affordable and more inclusive and more grains, right? Like, you know, there's lots of people in the U.S. who grew up eating teff, right, from their cultural background. We need to have more teff available. We need to have all these smaller cereals, quinoa, all of these things. They need, they, they need the same elevation the way uh, Western bakers elevate wheat. Real change can only come from a grassroots level um, because the bottom line is never the motivation there, right? So I, I don't I don't really know what's next. It's really overwhelming and kind of depressing to think about. And I feel like you can only do what you can do. Um, and I don't know how to bring all the different players in the in the grain movement and the good food movement together. And so we have a lot of clout. I, I feel the most effective and lasting change is absolutely working at the ground level and um, absolutely meeting people where they are. I remember going to the the Colorado um, Grain Conference, and they were working with an indigenous population there, and they had brought in some people to help them grow grains that were suitable to the area, and and also talked about corn really played a role in that conference, right? That that's an indigenous grain to North America, and. It needs to be recognized and it needs to be utilized and it needs to be honored. Um, so I think uh, us bakers in this new movement um, kind of need to check ourselves and realize that we're not really doing anything new. A lot of this stuff has been around. There's loads of cultures who do eat beautiful whole grains who make incredible flatbreads and other foods with these grains. And um, we need to get them involved, right? Or ask if we can get, ask how to partner with them, right? Um, yeah, and, and it really is gonna be, I think, person by person, community by community. And then that's, that's how the change will last, right? Um, it, it can't be top down.